Great. All right, so I'm going to just briefly talk about um, testis cancer. We're going to kind of, this is the outline of the talk, really talk about the incidence, definition, subtypes, the management of both seminomatous and non seminomatous germ cell tumors, and then talk about the surgical principles and kind of what's kind of new and coming right now in the testis cancer uh, realm. Um, so this is just the U.S. data and some global data, but uh, this is the data for 2021, roughly 9,470 cases um, with only 440 deaths. So not a big um, cause of mortality. The trends on the, the graph on the right is actually just the overall incidence of, of all cancers. So you can see that we're kind of the mortality rates are really, the incidence is roughly staying the same, but the mortality rates are kind of decreasing, which is showing that we're making some progress in terms of our incidence and mortality rates. Um, globally, though, there's around 52,000 new cases with almost 10,000 deaths worldwide. Um, and that's an old data, um, old statistics, but um, they anticipate that that's going to be significantly higher with the death trend a little bit le um, a little bit not as favorable as the U.S. trend. Um, and we can go into that in a little bit. But again, it's the most common malignancy in uh, men aged 20 to 40, highest in Caucasian, at least in the U.S. Uh, kind of heterogeneous population, very high in Caucasians and Hispanic populations, very low in the African Americans and the Asian population. The incidence is increasing from 2.1 per for every 100,000 to roughly six in 2020. Um, they kind of predict that due to a lot of the environmental exposures and toxins. Um, uh, which again, I can talk a little bit uh, in, at the very end, but um, that's pretty much the hypothesis right now. And there is a bimodal distribution of testis cancer um, from the young teens, uh, early adults to the midlife. Um, the common risk factors are cryptorchidism, um, family, positive family history, um, intratubular germ cell neoplasia, personal history of having a uh, uh, of testis cancer, Klein filters. Um, however, the most common one that people was asked about, and we get this still from our radio radiology colleagues, are the incidence of microlithiasis and saying that that's testis cancer or the need for follow up, and it really does not increase the risk for uh, testis cancer. So those those uh, those ultrasounds that we get uh, with significant microlithiasis routinely do not need to be followed up or, uh, periodically. And the types of testis cancer are either germ cell tumor or non-germ cell tumor. And the most common types, obviously, we know are the seminomatous and the non-seminomatous germ cell tumors. Um, and the non-germ non cell tumors are uh, very rare, so 5%. And those are the lymphomas, the sex cord uh, malignancy, so Leydig cells, Sertoli cells, and other kind of rare variants such as sarcomatoids um, and peritesticular masses. If we're looking at this uh, seminomatous, there's two types, the classic and spermatocytic, and those are usually due to the histological definition. Um, uh, the spermatocytic is almost the fried egg appearance that we classically see. And from the non-seminomatous, you have the yolk sac tumors, which are historically in, um, known for having a very high elevated AFP, or alpha-fetoprotein, and brinols, which are the most undifferentiated types of tumors. You have the choriocarcinomas, which are um, have very high elevations of beta HCG and hematogenously spread. So you tend to see a lot of brain metastasis and lung metastasis. And then you have the teratomas, which are sometimes our problem childs, and they're very chemotherapy resistant. And I'll go over a little bit about teratomas in um, future in the upcoming slides. So in testis cancer staging, we always want to stage the testicle first. Um, so you want to do the radical orchiectomy, um, stage them with uh, and get the final pathology staging, and you want to get tumor markers. Preoperative tumor markers are pretty classic, um, and that kind of just gives you an estimate or kind of a rough um, kind of guess on what type of histology we're dealing with. However, the S stage, which is really in terms for testis cancer staging, is our post orchiectomy markers. Once we have the final pathology and tumor markers and st S stage, which in the meantime, routinely, at least in our practice, we're getting CT, um, abdomen, pelvises, seminomas, you can get chest x-ray. However, for non-seminomas is germ cell tumors, we usually end up getting a CT chest. So that's why some people err on the side of waiting for the pathology to come back before getting a CT scan. Um, the, Nowadays, uh, with our kind of advances in our CT scanners, low-dose CTs are very, um, from in terms of a radiation standpoint, are very low. So one millisievert compared to a 10 millisievert, which is the standard dose for a CT scan. So some people just err on the side of getting a low-dose uh, CT chest, abdomen, pelvis. 
However, body habitus can come to play with that. So those are things to think about um, if you need to get a just pan scan the patient. And another next big thing too, as a urologist, we always need to discuss sperm banking as well, um, specifically for those patients who you plan or thinking about or they're gonna need chemotherapy. Um, so just briefly about the tumor markers. Um, so we know the beta HG, LDH, and AFU are kind of a standard tumor markers. LDH is almost just used for almost tumor burden. It's not really indicative of too active tumor. Um, and it's almost being thrown out in our AUA guidelines um, in our next iteration. However, the half-lives are roughly one, three, and five days. And we always want to get our tumor markers or post orchiectomy markers five half-lives after the orchiectomy. And so usually you want to get them around at six weeks, uh, which will incorporate all the half-lives of all of the tumor markers. But some people tend to get them um, a little bit earlier. And the kind of two tidbits, um, beta HCG can be elevated in hypogonadal men due to the elevated LH. So you always want to ensure that their testosterone is uh, um, adequate. If the testosterone is low, you can give the patient testosterone and then recheck their beta HCG. And then uh, tidbit on AFP, AFP are, tend to be elevated in a baby. So in our pediatric population with germ cell tumors, um, AFP can be falsely elevated in babies. So if you feel testicle mass and you have an elevated AFPP, you want to recheck it. So just a surgical approach for the radical orchidectomy, which you guys are all very familiar with. This is a high ligation and you want to get cord control. Indications for testis sparing surgery are pretty very well defined. So tumors must be less than three centimeters. And usually these are situations you use for men who have bilateral tumors or bilateral testis masses. A solitary testicle from whether it's a non-functioning testicle or, or um, orchiectomy for any other reason. And, um, or another reason or for patients who have normal tumor markers. However, this have this indeterminate appearance, whether that's on scrotal ultrasound or um, MRI or whatever imaging modality you have. Um, and it's very imperative you do frozen sections at the time of orchiectomy just to, to, to make sure that you have a complete resection of a suspicious lesion. Um, so sometimes we do get patients who undergo um, a transscrotal incision, and that's considered technically a scrotal violation. Um, in, most of the time, it's actually does not end up causing too too much too many issues. But however, if you have a low risk seminoma, you use, and if the patient's undergoing undergoing radiation therapy, you do want to uh, counsel the patient and discuss with your radiation oncologies to uh, provide radiation to that ipsilateral groin scar. Um, if you have a low risk non seminous germ cell tumor and they're going to get chemotherapy, um, you only need a scar in, in excision during the time of RPL and D. No other inguinal nodes are needed. Um, if you're doing, if you have a non seminous germ cell tumor and you're getting chemo uh, in terms of high risk, you don't need to do. Um, uh, excuse me for that first statement. No, if not giving chemo, you do need to do a scar excision with the RPL and D, and that would be a primary RPL and D. The, the third situation is if you have uh, giving the patient chemotherapy, you do not need to do a scar excision at the time. And this is just the staging of uh, testis cancer um, based on our uh, the P stage. Um, the one caveat to this is seminoma does have a PT1A and B caveat, uh, not in seen in non seminal germ cell tumor, and that's ba purely based on size. So if, uh, if you have a pure seminoma less than four centimeters, it's PT1A. Greater than four centimeters, it's PT1B. Um, and you can see the nodal metastasis uh, is really classified by, you can really think about it, less than two centimeters in uh, um, uh, retroperitoneal mets. N2 is Two between two and five, and then and three is greater than five. And this is this is just kind of an image, kind of just showing the rough stages. So the best way to think about it: stage one's local, stage two is in the retroperitoneum, and stage three is distant metastasis, or usually in the lung. Um, early stage is uh, usually really directed towards us. Uh, urology is really managing most of that, and as well as um, stage two, uh, N2, or stage 2B, excuse me, um, those are really kind of, the urology tends to take the reins in terms of the disease kind of management and who's really making the decisions. However, once we start getting to stage 2C and above, our medical oncology colleagues are really um, running the show in terms of since the main drive or main kind of treatment modality are is, is chemotherapy. Sometimes they need chemotherapy, 
rate, uh, RPLND followed by salvage chemotherapy as well. So um, those men are tend to be higher risk. Um, again, pathologic staging, um, which we kind of discussed, but the one to kind of take note of on this is our serum tumor marker staging. Um, S, S0 are the completely normal markers. S1, just think about it, that um, the tumor markers are less than 5,000 for HCG and less than 1,000 in AFP. Between For S2, between 5,000 and 50 or 1,000 and 10,000. Um, and then S3, greater than 50 and greater than 10. Um, and again, this is just a full complement of the staging, one, um, stage one through three C, um, incorporating the S uh, marker. And you can really see that really any um, S staging is a little complicated, but if you think about it, again, the best, best way to think about it is just stage one is local, stage two, retroperitoneal mats, stage three, distant mats. And then the risk classification, which something that we routinely uh, uh, use here are the good risk, intermediate risk, and poor risk. So some of us don't have any patients who are poor risk. Um, and the difference between good and intermediate risk are just not uh, pulmonary visceral mets versus pulmonary visceral mets. Um, or, uh, and then the non seminomatous tend to be differ between good and intermediate risk based on their S stage, and poor risk are mediastinal mets or non-visceral or non-pulmonary visceral meds, such as liver or brain. If we're, and now if we're really going to the treatment modalities, which you'll kind of see a common theme. So stage, looking at pure 7 for stage one, really surveillance is the kind of predominant um, uh, modality uh, um, in terms of the management. There is a roughly estimated 15% chance of retroperitoneal involvement. Um, uh, at when you're counseling these patients. So they just need to know that surveillance does harbor this 15% risk. However, that's the rationale for the frequent CTs and Im interval imaging. If you look at uh, non seminomatous again, stage one without risk factors, surveillance is still a good option. And again, you just counsel the patients in terms of um, that there are 15% risk of harboring disease uh, and there are also other options, though. You can also perform a primary RPLD or give one round or one cycle of chemotherapy. The caveat to this are patients with risk factors. Um, risk factors are lymphovascular invasion uh, or invasion of the retate testes on the pathologic stage of the testis. Um, anything greater than T2, so T3 um, or above, and anything that's embrinal. Those are higher risk factors. And those patients, if they have that, even though they have no retroperitoneal METs, um, and they're still stage one, they should still be canceled for nerve sparing RPLMD or chemotherapy um, because of those the higher risk um, of having retroperitoneal um, involvement. And again, this is just summarizing kind of the lower risk in stage one testis cancer. Stage low risk stage one for both seminomas and non seminomas germ cell tumors, surveillance is an option. Seminoma radiotherapy is an option, um, unlike non seminomous germ cell tumor, um, where non seminomous germ cell tumor is really one round of chemotherapy um, or an RPLD. The higher risk, like I said, surveillance is an option. However, you usually want to counsel those patients um, because you can see the rate of recurrence on surveillance is a little bit higher. And so those patients, uh, we have roughly a 40 to 60% chance that those patients should get one round of uh, um, BEP or primary RPLMD. In each, obviously, each modality has its pros and cons. Surveillance avoids unnecessary treatment. However, it does require surveillance imaging. The patient needs to follow up. And those are things you got to kind of suss out in terms of the social kind of situation the patient's in. Um, and you treat those recurrence patients with chemotherapy. Um, chemotherapy, you can give for both. However, it's a very high cure rate, which we know uh, ever since the uh, invention of the platinum-based chemotherapy. Um, however, you do have short and long-term toxicities, which we can talk about a little bit more in detail. Um, radiation therapy is really, it's comparable to chemotherapy for seminomas. Um, again, has its own toxicities, but then you talk about primary RPLMDs. Again, high cure rates, it does treat teratomas because chemotherapy does not touch teratomas. However, they do have the intraoperative risks. Um, if we're moving on to stage two for a pure seminoma, um, the stage 2A and 2B then go switch to three or four cycles of BEP, or excuse me, three cycles of BEP, four cycles of EP, so not including the bleomycin. 
um, oral radiation therapy. Um, for patients who have 2C, so bulky lymphadenopathy greater than five centimeters, those patients should not be getting any chemo or radiation therapy. It should only be chemotherapy and it should be four cycles of BEP. The caveat to this, which I'm going to go at the very end of the talk, is the new SEMS trial really sussing out what the role for primary RPLND in men with stage 2A and 2B for pure seminoma. Um, and these are just the radiation fields. So you usually have the standard bilateral template. You can have the modified dog leg template, which is in the middle, um, and that gets the ipsilateral. And then you can get the um, uh, a cone down version as well. And then if you look at the long studies, um, uh, you can see the five-year disease-specific disease survival are very comparable from, for radiation as well as carboplatin uh, for seminoma. So you can see at five years in every cohort for stage one, two, and three, that's 100% survival rate. So they're very comparable when you ask when patients say which one's better, um, comparing chemotherapy and radiation. If you're going to the non-seminomalous for stage two uh, higher risk or, or one S and higher and uh, two and above, Primary chemotherapy is usually the gold standard. Um, so stage two, all the way to 3A, three cycles, high risk. Uh, so stage uh, 3B is usually four cycles of chemotherapy. And again, bleomycin, it, uh, etomocycin, cisplatin is the standard therapy. Um, if you And if you look at the next slide, we're just looking at uh, higher or rates of relapse in terms of uh, patients after primary treatment. So rate of relapse is less than 1% at five years for seminomalous. Um, however, and you can look at or the, the, that's based on this kind of data right here. If you look at patients with uh, four cycles of uh, EP or three cycles of EBP, the viable rates of are, uh, viable cancer during the RPLND at five years is roughly six and 5%. So that's kind of where those numbers come from. Um, and the one thing to really consider are in seminos, unlike non seminos germ cell tumor is the role for a PET scan. So if patients have an, a residual mass greater than three centimeters, however, with normal tumor markers after chemotherapy in a pure seminoma, you can consider a PET scan, a PET scan um, will is only indicated in seminoma. So that's one more imaging modality we have. In non seminomas you after you give chemotherapy, and if you have a residual mass, you can kind of follow the algorithm. But one thing to really kind of note are patients who have fibrosis or necrosis and not viable tumor tend to have um, um, these kind of three kind of characteristics. One is the absence of teratoma in their orchiectomy specimen, which we know teratomas don't respond well to chemotherapy. You have the size post-chemo, so roughly um, uh, if you drop the, if anything is less or greater than one centimeter for non-seminose, it tends to be more consistent with active tumor. Less than one is most likely fibrous necrosis. And uh, another thing is 90% reduction in the mass um, from the, the retroperitoneal mass from pre-chemo uh, to post-chemo. And patients most of the time after um, RPLND sometimes may need um, a salvage therapy as well. And so just a tidbit on teratoma. Teratomas, uh, pure teratoma is very uncommon. Only two to 6% of them have them. However, roughly 47% of the non seminal germ cell tumors do have some sort of teratoma component. Um, Post-pubertal uh, patients have a biologically active component. Um, they're very chemotherapy resistant. And so that can help kind of help uh, dictate management with these patients, whether you think chemotherapy is uh, viable or not. Patients who have mixed uh, germ cell tumors um, or non seminose germ cell tumors, you'd think chemotherapy is still indicated if they have other components. However, patients who may have this indeterminate retroperitoneal mass, you should consider going in and taking it out because of the rates of a teratoma. They are very genetically unstable, and they have a high risk of malignant transformation into rhabdomyosarcomas, adenocarcinomas, or neuroendocrine. Um, so post-chemo RPLNDs is really uh, the kind of mainstay of metastatic teratomas, and, um, and really they're all related to the completeness of a surgical resection. So survival is higher in patients who undergo a post-chemo RPLND with a complete surgical resection. Patients who do not have a complete surgical resection and end up having some tumor left behind and undergo malignant transformation, usually five years out, 
um, which is only around three to six patients, three, three to six percent patients, those patients have a higher or lower survival, um, and they tend to have to need a higher risk of going a reoperative post chemo RPLD, which um, I'm sure many of you know if you've ever been back in there on a post a redo post chemo RPLD, those patients tend to have very difficult surgeries as well as the ability to do a thorough retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. Um, and then the last thing about um, metastatic teratoma, um, there's good studies showing concordance of the metastasis if you have a patient who's stage three or have pulmonary or um, lung mets. Um, there's a good concordance. So if your retroperitoneum has higher rates of necrosis, then you can extrapolate based on this data looking at um, uh, patients who underwent retroperitoneal lymph node dissection and also then thoracic surgery, looking at the concordance rates of necrosis being in the retroperitoneum as well as the, in the lungs, and they are very similar. So patients, usually you want to stage these patients who have uh, retroperitoneal mets, post-chemo, as well as lung mets. So do the retroperitoneum first, see if they have viable tumor with teratoma or necrosis. If they're Highly, if it all comes back as necrosis, you can follow the chest. If there, are, if there's a high component of teratoma, you need to get your thoracic surgery surgeons involved and go after those uh, procedures as, or after those uh, lesions as well. Talking about now, looking at the side effects, radiation therapy has obviously the side effect of fertility, cardiotoxicity, which is less. More less of a thing nowadays with our advance, our advance in technology, and then also secondary malignancies. Remember, these guys are very young, and so we tend to see these toxicities kind of pan out later in life. And these kids are living long enough, so we're seeing that. Um, and then chemotherapy, bleomycin also has a lot of pulmonary toxicity issues. Etoposide has a lot of neuropathy issues, and cisplatin causes a lot of renal dysfunction, odo, and uh, neurotoxicity as well. It can cause neutropenia as well. And then the, we worry about the fertility issues. Um, so they both can cause fertility issues. And if you're looking at the long-term studies, uh, roughly only 48% of patients recover at two years and 80%, uh, excuse me for the typo, but 80% of these patients recover at five years. Um, so when you're counseling patients, you need to discuss the rates of fertility issues. And that's why preoperative or pre-chemo or pre-surgery, pre-radiation uh, discussion about uh, sperm banking is very important for these uh, young guys, especially if they're not done having kids or they haven't started their lives. Because if you can look at the five years, roughly 20% of patients don't regain their fertility issue or have, or have spermatogenesis sufficient enough for fertility. Now kind of moving on to this, the RPLND. Um, so really we have the bilateral template and then we have our modified templates. So our right modified templates really for our right testicular lesions, and it really omits the periaortics below the IMA. And that is crucial for our um, the nerve spare plane because, and I'll show you in the next couple of images where the nerves kind of pop out between your pre and post sympathetic ganglion between the IVC and the aorta, and they cross up above the bifurcation. The left, for the left side of primary testis tumor, um, you omit the pair cables. So you can see Para, uh, right modifies the green, uh, para, um, the left is in the purple. Um, again, they both confer better fertility since they don't cross over uh, where the aortic bifurcation is where your nerves are crossing. And then your standard bilateral template, your superior margins are the renal hilum, your lateral templates are the ureter, um, and then your inferior margin are at the, end, uh, the bifurcation of your iliac vessels. Um, and if, if you, one more quick, uh, quick thing about this. So the rates of recurrence, they've looked at that too in terms of the modified versus bilateral. Bilateral template uh, rates of recurrence are less than 2%, roughly on one point ranging from one to two. Um, my modified templates has a higher rates of uh, um, recurrence at five to 10%. And uh, so those needs to be discussed with patients. Um, and you can still perform a good nerve spare doing a bilateral template. Um, and so again, your post-sympathetic uh, uh, post uh, sympathetic or the ganglion sympathetics are posterior to your aorta and they cross anterior on the aorta at the bifurcation. And again, that's the most common side of transection. You can see the really good um, fibers uh, right here. And you can see this is the white space right here is your anterior longitudinal spinous process, uh, ligament. Your IBC is in the blue and the red is over here is the aorta. Um, and again, the very at the end of the day, nerve sparing RPLD should never on compromise oncologic outcomes. So if you do have lymphadenopathy or tissue down 
that area, uh, that tissue should be removed uh, and, you, should, um, and you, you would have to uh, transect the nerves if needed. Um, again, you can see this is a bilateral template uh, nerve spare. You can see one of the nerves crossing up and over between the IVC and the aorta coming open right over the bifurcation. Um, and this was a full bilateral template, which uh, we were able to spare um, at least one robust uh, nerve. Uh, another one was involving some of the tissue, so we didn't want to leave that behind. And again, the basis of an, a good retroperitoneal lymph node dissection is really cleaning out the retroperitoneum. And this, you should be able to get both hands underneath your the great vessels and ligating lumbar, um, and uh, vertebral arteries and vessels uh, to make sure you're thoroughly cleaning out the retroperitoneum because especially, especially in patients with teratomas, um, those patients have the risk of malignant transformation. You don't want to go back and reoperate on those guys. And so if you're looking at the surveillance for these patients, um, for seminomas, it's a little bit less rigorous. Um, and it's for the first year, it's Q3 months for the first year, Q6 months for the second year, and annually for five years. Um, you can just get uh, tumor markers that have a CT scan, um, uh, and you don't necessarily need to get, um, uh, you can get chest x-rays as well. For non seminal germ cell tumors, you do need, again, the physical exam, but you do need tumor, or excuse me, for seminal, you don't need tumor markers, excuse me, misspoke, tumor markers for non seminal germ cell tumor with every CT scan, and you're just getting more frequent CT scans. So you're doing Q3 months for, um, usually most people do it for three years. Um, and so now for you going to shift to kind of like the future directions, what's kind of going on in testis cancer right now. Um, uh, microRNA has kind of come around and really discovered in 2006, um, as first reported usually with, uh, microRNA 372 and 373 as prudent, potential tumor markers or germ cell tumors. In 2010, 371 through 373 and microRNA 302 cluster was kind of reported as well. So now we really have these four microRNAs that are robust, that are really doing well. Subsequent data really show that microRNA 371, 3P, which is just 371, um, really outperformed the other and was the leading out of all of the other ones. And if we're looking at, um, if you're looking at the, some of the kind of data behind it, we're really looking at make microRNA 371 has a really good area under the curve. So 0 0.98 for identifying viable disease. However, the limitations to microRNA so far, which I'll discuss in a little bit more detail, but it really starts off with most of these studies are retrospective and they're ongoing clinical trials now, namely at um, UT Southwestern. Um, we're looking at um, the clinical trials and future prospective studies on microRNA. Uh, issues and limitations about this are um, that there's no agreed standard unit for measurement, and there's no real agreed cutoff for normal. So that's where we're really having a lot of issues. And But also another caveat to 371 is it doesn't really do well in, in identifying teratoma. Um, so you really don't know if a low value means it's not teratoma or does it require treatment or not. However, or on a follow-up study, uh, microRNA 371 was not associated with teratoma. However, they found that microRNA 375 was elevated in teratoma. So we may have this combination of these two microRNAs to help determine which patients need treatment or not. And these are really going to augment the alpha feta protein and beta ACG not really taking over. And these are really going to be used after the initial staging and follow-up for patients who've undergone chemotherapy or have undergone key, um, RPL and Ds. And that's what the real role for the microRNAs are. Another big issue for microRNAs, getting to the basic science, there's, there's a lot of issues in terms of collection methods, and that's that's another issue in terms of um, since it's so unstable. So there's a lot of degradation in the microRNA. So there, that's another limitation we're having. Uh, but these are the two kind of trials that are kind of going on, the SWOG um, S1823 and the Children's Oncology Group, looking at the microRNAs in the germ cell space. And another big thing kind of coming around in germ cell tumors and testis cancer is really uh, the SEMS trial. So the SEMS trial really is a single arm multi-institutional phase two they finish accruing, so the state phase three data will be available in about four years um, for the use of a primary RPLND as the first line treatment for pure seminoma. Um, and they're really looking at patients with stage one disease with a retroperitoneal relapse on surveillance or stage 
stage 2a and stage 3b so disease less than one to three centimeters within for their um, cutoffs uh, within the template and really the rationale for the study was to avoid the toxicities in these young guys uh, from chemo and radiation um, so in the phase two data, we have 55 patients that are accrued. 14 were stage uh, early relapse stage one, 44 stage two in A and B. The recurrence rate was roughly 18% after these men underwent um, a primary RPL and D. However, most of those men um, uh, went on to get chemotherapy. And the two-year recurrence free survival uh, was 87%. And the overall survival was 100%. So we know that if you, when you're counseling patients, usually say 85% chance or 83% um, chance of being completely cancer-free with no risk of the toxicities of chemotherapy and radiation. And most of these men were counseled about um, nerve sparing with the uh, caveat, if, to, if it um, suffered or if it would put compromised oncologic control, they would get a non-nerve sparing. So 83% you're cured, 18%, you may need additional treatment and that additional treatment would be chemo. And even with that, you have your five, your three, two year overall survival rate still 100%. And so the early data um, shows that the surgery offers similar cancer control. Um, and so really it may be in the new set of guidelines, we may be utilizing that over radiation and radiation may be for someone that's not fit for surgery, morbidly obese or has a lot of other issues or refuses surgery. And then the one other thing from us, this being a surgical trial, um, uh, only seven, pa seven patients, uh, so 13% did uh, experience a short-term complication within one of those years. And 9% of those were uh, uh, low risk of um, what we consider a readmission um, or an infect surgical site infection. And two, uh, only 3%, so two patients had um, a little bit higher. So needing either like a drain for a lymphocele or et cetera. Um, so relatively well tolerated. Um, so for really kind of wrapping up, uh, seminoma and non seminoma germ cell tumors act very different. And really the key is you got to understand, we have to stage our patients differently. Radiation is only used for pure seminoma. However, the SEMS trial may be changing this and hope that it's not going to be anytime soon um, in the next four years, but we're still offering here, at least at Hopkins, um, we're offering um, primary um, RPL and D for patients who fit that kind of SEMS trial cohort. Um, stage really dictates treatment. Stage the testicle first and then the retroperitoneum. Um, big thing that I think sometimes we for, often forget uh, are discussing fertility with patients. Um, and we I tend to do that in a lot of my mentors did that as well at the, ver at the initial encounter. Um, and just kind of putting it uh, as well as discussion after the pathology. And our PLNDs are, a, they're big surgeries. Um, they can be very challenging sometimes, especially in the post chemo space. Um, and we know that patients who get incomplete resections or uh, um, at higher risk of relapse, but also they can be posed themselves to a higher uh, surgical complications and risk. And sometimes these patients do need vascular surgery, thoracic surgery to be helping uh, them. So RPLDs usually should be done at experienced centers or high volume surgeons where they can have multidisciplinary teams um, with vascular surgery, uh, experienced anesthesia to be doing them. Because sometimes we do have to do aortic resections, um, vascular resections. Um, and sometimes these patients have rough post-surgical uh, courses. So um, those are the key points of this testis cancer talk. Um, I wanted to leave uh, some time for you guys to ask questions or present cases. Hopefully that was informative and the, the future directions kind of shed some light on what we're doing in the germ cell space right now. Great. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Pato. Of course. It's been a wonderful presentation. Um, testicular cancer is uh, something that's quite rare here in Kumasi. Okay. The last time I treated somebody for testicular cancer should be more than seven years ago. And so, okay. well, 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 that's this that's is that's, quite that's, that's you're, you're fortunate. That's you're fortunate that you're not the, these young men. We have a good amount that come over here. Um, but that's good, though. Um, 
So when when they do present though, I know you and I discussed this about your the kidney cancer stuff, but, but when they do present, are they presenting very advanced stage or are they presenting with just a testicular mass? Uh, mostly they are presenting with very advanced disease. Fortunately, well, I even forgot that recently, just about uh, six months ago, a couple came to see me over fertility issues. And then I found that, that one of the testicles was uh, far bigger and harder than the other one. And so, and they, and they came with azospermia. So I uh, driving back to the point you made about uh, sperm banking and all, it happened that, it so happened that this patient had azospermia and one of the testes was also looking like malignant. And so I took, I took, I did a radical for that side and took a biopsy of the normal contralateral side. It came out that it was a part testicular tumor. It wasn't a gem cell tumor. This patient was about 39 years or so actually. Okay. And, and um, there was also primary testicular arrest or testicular failure in the contralateral testes. And so that is my experience in fact, the recent experience I've had with testicular cancers. Um, I would like the floor to share their experiences and to ask questions if they do have. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Amwa, if you are there, if you want to unmute yourself and make a comment. Yeah, I, want, I just want to talk, uh, Dr. Okay, you're you, prof. Okay, okay. It's, it has been a wonderful presentation. And yeah. I think uh, I commend the presenter very well. Uh, the, one of the risk factors has been labeled as pest. I think you're, you're muted, so I can't hear you. Something that we need to look to. Because those of us in the developing world, uh, we appear to be a bit more uh, unhygienic, a bit more unhygienic than those in the developed world. That's... Mm. A higher incidence than those in the developed world. But as he presented, you know, it is higher over there than here. And as you just said, I, I, the last time I saw a testicular tumor should be more than even four or five years ago. So I just want him to throw light on this uh, personal hygienic, uh, personal hygienic issue. Uh, as a risk factor for testicular uh, cancers. Yeah, that's that's quite interesting. I, I haven't ever heard it kind of posed that way. So what we what we're hypothesizing is actually a study I'm doing currently right now. Um, so we know that um, bladder cancer and testis cancer are almost similar in terms of their environmental exposures and looking at organophosphates. So organophosphates are a common thing that we use, in, at least in the U.S. and other uh, countries, um, for pesticides. Um, and we're seeing that, and as well as we're also using a lot more plastic and disposable items. So I'm actually currently looking at uh, doing a study with environmental toxins and plastic derivatives such as BPA or bisphenol A and other organophosphates to see the incidence of why incidence of testis cancer is rising as well as bladder cancer for, um, for us. And kind of commenting on that, I think the reason why is, I don't think it has anything to do with the gen, there's a genetic component, but I think there's an environmental and you may be right in terms of kind of the personal hygiene aspect too. Um, so that's what we're trying to figure out why. And that's, a, that's something that 
um, we're actively looking at right now. I still don't, I have the data for the lab prelim data for proof of concept showing that bisphenol A or BPA is elevated in bladder cancer, but we're, we're waiting for the testis cancer data and we're gonna in, do a much larger study. This is just a proof of concept, but along those same lines, very similar. Um, so hopefully we get the data soon and we can share it with everyone because there's something that we're not doing right or, or exposing our young guys or young men are being exposed to certain toxins or certain things that are increase our in incidence. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Any other comments? Roland, you want to make a comment? Yeah, hello. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yeah. Yes, I yeah, can hear you. Excellent, excellent presentation. This part, I think we part was in Kumasi, that was about two or three years ago. That's right, you are right. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, this is Roland. Hey, Roland. I remember me. Yeah. I do I remember you. Yeah, I brought, uh, there was a patient I had who had an inflectable pina implant. I know, I remember then, exactly who you are. And I, yeah, just, I took him to the side room to examine him. I remember. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. That scene once again. No, I know. I, I Once we were able to travel on my first trip, I want to come back and see you guys. That would be yes. great to see yes. you again. That would be lovely. Nice, wonderful presentation. How, how's my buddy JB doing? He's doing very well. Good, yeah. good. Doing very well. Doing very well. Yeah. No, Good. I'm happy. Uh, happy to take questions. If you don't have any, always feel free to. If you guys have a case that you want to ask me a question about, um, always. Dr. Dai has my email too. Danielle and I you have my email. You're always more than always feel free to reach out and email me um about if, if you have a question of a patient or anything like that. I'm happy to always help you guys out. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Just one, one question. Uh, yeah. I don't know whether you have any experience with the, the non gem cell tumors, like late cell tumor, septoli cell tumor. No, they are not yeah. so common, but have you had any experience with the non gem cell tumor? Yeah. So the non gem cell tumor, I personally have not seen a single one. They're very okay. rare. Um, I've done, I mean, we've, we see a lot of the normal, the germ cell tumors here, we get quite a bit, um, more so than the average kind of um, hospital in the US. But in all honesty, I haven't seen a single non uh, germ cell tumor. I mean, I've seen some paratesticular tumors, some sarcomas that we do, but we just treat them like a sarcoma. So we do wide excisions um, and you change up the chemotherapy with your surgical oncologist. Um, however, I've never, I've actually never seen a lay dig or sertoli. But those tend not to be as um, uh, malignant. And the ones that we worry about are those variants, the paratisicular variants that are, tend to be um, spindle cell or uh, sarcomatoid or rabbit myosarcomas. Those ones are very aggressive. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you, Roland. So in the absence of any other comments or questions, yeah. We would like to thank once again the presenter and IVU Med for facilitating this uh, presentation. Uh, is uh, Dr. Aaron, you want to make a comment? Okay. So I think our next IVU lecture should be around the 30th and I, 30th of this month. It's on um, congenital abnormalities. It's a case discussion that we've been having with two consultants, um, Dr. Christine and Dr. Sweeney. And so until that time, we say very a big thank you to Dr. Patel for always being around for us. And we are expecting to see you once the in-person workshop start. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. Have a good day. Okay, Great. Thank guys. You. And we'll have this link emailed to you. So if you want to go back and watch the video again, um, it will be, the link will be emailed to you. It'll also be on our YouTube channel and also on our website. And I'm Dr. Sweeney. So I will see you guys. Um, it's September 30th is when we're having that case presentation lecture. 
Um, and so I will see you all then. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Everyone. Have, a, have a good night and thank you for coming. Thank you, Dr. Thanks, Dr. Patel, too. Okay. Thank you. Bye.